I'm going to invite uh, Jonas Anker to the, to the stage. He runs his own asset management firm, Anker Capital. Uh, many of you remember his colleague who was at San Moritz at the FT Winter. Um, we're happy to have Jonas with us. And Jonas is behind um, founding and setting up some, some unicorns. So he's going to share with us, yeah, several. Uh, his, his, uh, his business, his portfolio. Would you please welcome Jonas Anker? Jonas. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I try to be mindful of time and make it as interesting as possible. If you have questions, feel free to ask immediately. Don't wait for the end because potentially you're going to forget what you want to ask. <clears throat> Very briefly, uh, the way I'm going to present is quickly about Anchor Capital. And oh, here is the work. Very good. Next, back. Uh, then I go into two specific deals related to the music industry because, as you saw, the question of today is how can music be a great hedge against the coming years of potential hyperinflation? So, as I said very quickly about Anchor Capital, <clears throat> we are a globally active tech investor with a unique network and skill set to support our portfolio companies to deliver fast growth and superior returns to our investors. That sounds a bit blah, blah, standard, but we get there in one second. Uh, we are looking yearly at 300 plus companies. We do one to two uh, investments, and then we work very closely and very active with the portfolio companies we invest in. Um, we typically invest in seed stage to series A. We like to see some product market fit. We like to see some scaling revenues, obviously in the lower millions, regions, Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, seed to Series A. It would be already Series B or onwards. Uh, we have delivered an impressive track record, which I'm quite proud of, because I've worked 24-7 to deliver the returns we were able to deliver. Uh, I would like to let the numbers speak quickly a bit. We actually built one unicorn company called Utopia Music AG. We did a 600,000 euro seed investment in 2016. At the six million seed money valuation, we raised for Utopia. Sorry, quickly, we do SPVs typically, but we started by raising directly to the cap table. So we syndicated for Utopia a mix between SPV and direct funding to the cap table, 130 million euro, roughly, through Anchor Capital and our close partners. We raised last year 40 million at 1.5 billion euro pre money valuation. So it was basically our first unicorn story. Quick spoiler alert, this year we need to do a down round because uh, it's tech and the tech market has gone down massively as you all have seen last year. But still, um, it's quite a good achievement. The returns have been very good, obviously, since we started investing at 6 million seed money valuation. Um, then, it's just the four biggest investment I quickly run through. Music Bird is my asset management firm where we are buying music copyrights. That's then the second part I'm going to elaborate a bit on. Music Bird as an asset management business. Here we raised roughly 35, 36 million Swiss francs so far. We have today assets a little bit shy of 50 million US dollars, which is signed in January actually. A 100 million credit line with a US bank. It was my first deal that I could sign as chairman of that company over $100 million was quite a good feeling. Next time it's a billion. So that's uh, Music Bird. Right up will be my next unicorn company in the legal tech space based in London. The founder built a six billion pound stock market listed company before called CPA Global, sold it then to Clarivate successfully. We invested to date eight million pound with a very well-known established VC from London called First Minute Capital. That's my 3D printing company. That's late stage private equity. Uh, roughly 80% of what we do is venture capital. 20% is private equity. This is uh, our, as I said, late stage private equity deal that we're going to exit in the next one to two years. We invested roughly 25 million to date in Exentis. I'm going to put in another 20 million roughly in the next 12 to 15 months. And then I said, exit it realistically in one to two years. That was, as I said, the four biggest deal where we invested between 10 to 130 million through Anchor. Uh, obviously, I can share more information on all deals. If there is any appetite, interest, then in a one-to-one -one conversation, 
very briefly how did the journey start in the music industry. It started with Utopia as a data management company. In a nutshell, I said I will do that very high level, not to bore you. I try to make it as interesting and uh, fascinating as possible. Utopia is a data collection platform. There is no other company in the world that tracks more data when it comes to who is listening to which song, where and when. As you know, music is a royalty business, means when you own it and somebody is actually using your copyright, they're supposed to pay. Radio stations, nightclubs, restaurants, bars, so on. Today, actually, at least 50% of all the royalties are not paid because the music is consumed, used without being paid for. It's very hard to control today because we moved from an analog way of consuming music, CDs, vinyl, Today, it's all streaming, internet, radio, YouTube, social media. That's a big problem that Utopia tries to solve. How, as said, we collect the data, we sort the data, and we pay the rightful owner. Here you see a few selected clients we work with today. There are a lot of big names, like Universal Music, everybody knows. I believe we just sold one of our companies for $51 million to Believe including a five-year partnership deal, over 100 million, with belief. Um, some of the big investors, Alta Cumulus is a seven billion private equity fund from Sweden. Nordy Guy is one of my VCs uh, from Oslo, I think, as Norway. Uh, Progressive Capital is a Swiss one. Coel is a big institution client from, from Sweden. Um, BNF is a big family office uh, from London. But the biggest investor is actually Life for IT. That's Francisco Fernandez. He's a very close friend and partner of mine. He's a self-made billionaire from Switzerland. Um, a quick business snapshot that you see where we stand today. We roughly have 330 million in gross transactional volume this year, equaling net revenue for distribution services of 24, including royalty tech. It will be roughly 46 million of net revenues this year for the company. Um, that's again what we saw before. We collect the data, we try to sort it out, means where was the consumption, who is actually owning the music, so static data obviously, and then payment processing is a big part of what we do. Um, financial forecast, you see, uh, as I said before, uh, for me important is the net revenue. This year we're roughly at 60, uh, 46 million net revenue. We will be cash flow positive realistically in June 24. We are actually now raising uh, around 60 million for Utopia. We closed around 15 million in the last few weeks. So interest is high because, as I said, valuation is much, much lower. It's not the unicorn valuation at the moment. So if you guys have interest, appetite, let me know. We talk to a lot of sophisticated, smart investors from family offices to, as I said, institutional investors. Then, what happened in 2019, actually, Utopia wanted to buy the catalog, also the music rights of James Brown. Makes sense, right? If you have all the data, you know who is listening to what, why shouldn't you buy the asset and make much more money out of the assets? The problem was all the big clients we used to work with back in the days, uh, like Universal, Warner, as in pilot cases back then, they said very clearly, if we are going to buy copyrights ourselves, we would be seen as a competitor and not as a partner, a pure data partner. So Utopia decided to stick to the data management business instead of actually going in themselves and buy copyrights. And that's what I saw a unique opportunity to set up my own vehicle to buy music copyrights. Music copyrights, why is the asset class interesting? It's quite simple. You all know real estate. We spoke today quite a lot about Greek real estate, real estate globally. Why is real estate interesting? Very simple. You have recurring revenues. You can get an LTV from your bank. Uh, we all know in tendency prices go up because there is a huge demand. More and more people want to move to cities, blah, blah, blah. So actually today in most European countries or Western uh, countries, the net yields for real estate are extremely low and not really attractive for private investors because the yields simply are too low, except you develop st stuff yourself. Um, music is a 100% identical asset class. It is bankable. 
you can get a leverage from a bank on it, so you can uh, get a debt financing against it, but the yields are way higher because there is way less competition. It's a much younger asset class than real estate that has been around for thousands of years effectively. Uh, music as an asset class started 10 years ago basically with the first institutional investors buying music and then really broke loose with hypnosis starting five years ago in London. They own today a bit shy of 3 billion AUMs. Blackstone just put in 1.5 billion. So that's why I said it makes sense to set up my own vehicle, start acquiring music copyrights with Music Bird and obviously have a close partnership with Utopia as a data management partner. So here, very short, an executive summary about what Music Bird is doing. Today we own four catalogs, including big names like Shaggy, Mr. Bombastic, Mr. Lover Lover, you all know, pretty cool stuff that we bought there. Um, it's a set very persistent. Uh, it is 100% uncorrelated to any other asset class. Actually, if there is war, people listen to more music because they need distractions. If there are good times, people want to go party, so they listen to more music as well. So as I said, a very nice asset class from, from that side. Today, the assets we bought was actually 33.6 million, what we invested. That was over the last one and a half years. Today, these assets are valued from an independent external valuator, obviously, at roughly $45 million. So we delivered quite a huge increase in valuation. Um, it's quite simple. We have a blue chip strategy. In the music industry, it's called Evergreen. That means we're only going for big established names with 10, 20, 30, 40 years of track record. We don't do the risky stuff, the new stuff that makes no sense for, for us because we try to deliver superior returns with a very little risk profile. The goal is very clear. We want to have uh, around 1 billion AUMs uh, by 26, 27, roughly. Um, <clears throat> 27 is here in the presentation. That would actually lead to roughly 80 million to 100 million of net revenues to the company, which is quite attractive. MusicBird is on a mission to build a portfolio of world-class music rights and to innovate in both rights acquisition, management and portfolio monetization. Just very briefly, we have quite an established uh, management. My CEO is a very well-known guy, he's originally a music lawyer. He worked as top executive guy at Spotify, at Disney, at Sony, at Pandora. The CFO actually used to be the senior vice president of finance at Hypnosis, the world market leader. So we have quite a good setup there. The board is myself. I founded the company. I'm still the chairman of uh, MusicBird. Ebi is an investment banker from uh, Switzerland. He was the former CEO of Stiefel Europe and main first bank. And Francisco Fernandez is a very well-known self-made billionaire from Switzerland. He is the biggest investor actually in the company, including myself. So that's not so important. The question model, how we do due diligence, it's very institutional. As I said, we signed a 100 million credit line with MEFG in January. So we have a lot of external controlling mechanism to make sure we only buy high quality assets, which obviously is good for investors that are putting in now a lot of money. We are raising actually in Q3 15 million to get more from the debt facility. As I said, it's a 100 million debt facility. With every debt facility, you need to have equity to draw down more on your debt facility. Yeah? Building a house of hits, that's what we, want, what we are doing with Music Bird. As I said, we bought Shaggy. It wasn't me, Angel, Mr. Bombastic. Uh, we bought J.R. Rotem. He has top songs from Jason Derulo, Sean Kingston, J.R.S., many other big names in that catalog. No, no, no. From Sarah Larson, some songs, Maroon 5. Fallout Boy, why do I quickly present this? It's our first song that reached 1 billion streams on Spotify last week. That's like the big milestone that every artist wants to reach. 1 billion plus streams on Spotify because these songs are extremely valuable. There is a lot of press internationally. You're reading every week actually about an artist selling catalogs or another private equity firm moving in. 
in that space. Why? It's quite simple. Over the next decade, Goldman Sachs is forecasting that the market is doubling to tripling in value. They expect that the revenues from streaming alone will go up from 30 billion to 90 billion plus. It's like a tripling in st only in streaming revenues over the next decade. That's the reason why all the big PEs from Blackstone, BlackRock, KKR, Elliott, PIMCO, uh, Northleaf, they're all putting in billions of dollars at the moment in that industry. That's basically summarizing what I just said. There is a lot of tailwinds, uh, legislative changes uh, in the US actually, that is making sure that more money gets paid out to the music owners uh, for streaming. YouTube monetization, actually last year, um, TikTok paid for the first time uh, royalties. So that's gonna be a big, big change for all the music owners because more and more social media players need to pay and will pay uh, music royalties. So the conclusion, why is music, in my view, a good hedge against potential hyperinflation? As I said very clearly, it's 100% uncorrelated to public markets and any other asset class. You have recurring revenue similar to real estate. We get paid quarterly to half yearly from the collecting agencies. There is a huge growth happening in the market. The CAGR is roughly at 10 to 12% yearly at the moment, which is massive. There is big growth potential in general. It's a bankable asset. There's extremely high demand uh, for the asset. One last number that I'm pretty proud of, because I said I'm a big shareholder in the company. We bought our assets at a net yield of 6.3%. I said, that was over the last 15 to 18 months. Today, we are at 8.2% net yield on our assets. We are very sure over the next two, three years, we're gonna reach 10% net yield on our assets, which is quite attractive. So that was, I think, quite short to the point. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Jonas. Very impressive what you've, what you've built. When did you set up Anchor Capital again? When was the beginning? I started in 2016, yes. and then I met the founders of Utopia from a former CFO, and I said okay. we then did the seed investment of 600,000. Okay, fantastic. So, so eight years that you've been building Anchor and the, the businesses, yeah? Yes, I built Anchor Capital. Today I have eight, nine employees within Anchor Capital, but I have a lot of partners, uh, family offices, funds, brokers all around the planet, actually, that are raising money for my deals. And we built several deals like Utopia, first on a daily basis, then the bigger it become, I was less and less involved, but I'm very involved in all the big portfolio companies. Basically, as a business developer, as a venture builder, I'm good at organizing things and putting the right thoughts together. That's basically my strength. And when you meet an entrepreneur, do you know immediately and then you kind of justify through the due diligence that your instinct is correct? Or do you try to keep yourself open? You don't know whether you want to invest and you, you kind of, or is it just immediate? So the, Actually, I think that's a good question, Julie. So I believe a lot in instincts. I trained all my life martial arts. I competed internationally in martial arts 10 years ago. I believe in instinct quite a lot. I can immediately tell if I like a person, if I think the person has potential or not. But obviously, I am very open to due diligence results from my team. Mm -hmm. So no, I would not push through something just because my instinct tells me it's a smart guy. Mm -hmm. I want to have verification mostly from people that, that have been in a specific industry for a very long time. To make an example, if I have a guy that has an interesting deal in the transport industry that is considered to be interesting potentially. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know a billionaire that built a company with 34,000 employees in transportation industry. And if that guy then comes and says, after due diligence with his team, we're gonna put in a few million, then I say, I follow the wisdom of a guy that is 70 years of age mm -hmm. and has built a multi-billion dollar company. So I'd be very humble and follow his lead. So that's typically what we do with all the investments we do. Okay. And do you, do you think of yourself as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a builder, as a founder? How do you think of yourself? I think that's a good question too. Um, 
to be honest, uh, both. When people ask me what do you do, what you are, I say an entrepreneur, because Music Bird has said I first actually managed it as a CEO over a year. So I am an entrepreneur, but I love to invest and then I said help very actively. Often I'm a board member, I'm a strategic advisor to a company. And that's how I like, I like to deliver fast results by connecting the dots and not losing time. I like efficiency. Yep. Well, and you're Swiss, um, so that makes sense. So you're a Swiss, but you're in <laughs> Greece. What do you think that the opportunity is for a Swiss investor? And you work with, as you said, many of the very successful, significant Swiss investors to invest in Greece based on what you kind of heard. Would you recommend Greece as an investment opportunity? for your Swiss investors? Also, to be honest, I know not enough yet to give a final conclusion to, to that question. I see in general there is a lot of potential in Eastern Europe. At the moment, I'm quite active mm -hmm. in the Balkan countries. Greece is not so far away. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would need to know more about the numbers of the economy here, see, meet mm -hmm. uh, people. But mm -hmm. in general, I would say, yes, it's a... Uh, Mm -hmm. Eastern Europe is a very interesting region to, to be active as an investor. I agree with that completely, absolutely. Questions? Any questions for, for Jonas? Now, um, you have one? You have one. Yeah, I was thinking maybe time. No, Charles? Very fast. Yeah. So I'm mindful of your time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because you mentioned uh, something quite interesting that TikTok is going to is just started to pay out royalties. Yeah. So TikTok doesn't put the music on themselves, and that caters also to other social media, right? Like Instagram and all that, where the people are just putting up videos and putting music on top of it, even though they're short segments. How is that? Like, who's going to be responsible to pay? Is it the company itself, but they're just because they're putting on content, but it's not, they're not charging the people putting the content on? Yeah, what you say is interesting and is correct. Um, you know... Actually, it's a big problem for many social media providers. YouTube is uh, one of the first ones that got sued very often because people uploaded music that was not, was not actually their music, but they actually then got paid because they uploaded the video from, for example, Shaggy. Let's stick to Shaggy, right? So there happened a lot of new legislation globally. In the USA, you had this MMA Music Modernization Act. EU did also some new rules for, for EU. So it's actually the, the social media platforms are responsible. That's why YouTube has quite a, a tough screening process today. Um, same is starting to happen at TikTok, uh, Instagram and so on, because they are legally responsible for the uploads of their uh, users. So that's actually a huge opportunity for investments because there are companies like Lict and other portfolio companies we put in 1.5 million or so in UK. Pink Floyd actually invested in that one and Universal as well because what they do is micro-licensing of hot music that you then can go and pay through a subscription model and you can then use their stock music and use it in your videos that you're uploading as a YouTuber and so on. And that's quite a big uh, thing. For example, Epidemic Sound is a unicorn from Sweden. Just with that, they build a huge catalog of stock music that they're then... Uh, in a uh, subscription model, basically selling to, to the bloggers so they can use the content on social media without getting sued. Like a, like a Spotify for influencers. Yeah, so to speak, yeah. What, what about unsigned artists? There's, there's just a, you know, probably a bigger market of artists that are not yet signed, right? Inside artists. Unsigned, unsigned. Yeah. That is, an, that is another big point. You're correct, yes, but there obviously is way more risk. So if you look from it at a, as an investment perspective, I want to minimize my risk and still have good returns, right? Yep. So that's why we go for blue chip assets to start. Obviously, my idea is as a venture guy by plot, I love risk and high returns. Yep. So obviously, when I have 1 billion AOMs, or already when I have two, 300 million AOMs, I like to invest 1 to 5% of my AOMs into young hot talents mm -hmm. where I believe they're going to be big superstars because then it's like a venture portfolio, right? You have private equity investments, you have a bit of blue chip stocks, well, real estate, whatever, and you do your venture. So mm -hmm. that would then be the on-site artist, but that's happening when we are a bit bigger. Okay. Uh, you, Just had a question Giovanni when you talk about governance and you talk about regulation and things of that nature. When people are remixing songs and DJs are making millions of dollars and they're using 
one of your artists, is there legislation that speaks to a certain percentage of a song that is proprietary to an artist? And if that is utilized, then you guys should benefit? 100% co correct, Giovanni. We actually even do that as a business model. We, <laughs> we re-record top pits like Shaggy. We're going to do remixes with young, hot talents and produce other big hits. Uh, and as a rightful owner, we own the right to share, right? The, right the, the one who wrote the song, that's the right to share. We bought that, so when you do a remix, we're still getting paid because we own the lyrics and the song. Yeah. Excellent. Alex. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Yeah, so um, can this be applied, or does it, can it be applied to other types of digital audio? For example, you mean other kind of digital audio? Uh, podcasts or whatever. W w what's the future? I mean, for 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 cause this is music. I understand music, but but the whole the, the platform and the concepts C can this and will this expand to other types of content? You mean but books, um, art on the walls? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking. Creative. I mean, I'm thinking podcasting, but okay. you know, other kinds of audio, okay. you know, sound-based uh, content. Uh, Podcast, I would say, not really, because a podcast you listen to only once. I mean, what's your favorite song? It's a question. How many times have you listened to it? That's the point, right? A podcast typically you listen to once, maximum twice. So I wouldn't say necessarily with podcasts, but obviously audiobooks is the same principle. It's a copyright, but I'm not familiar with the yields and market growth and stuff. Music is the most interesting one at the moment because of the technology shift, right? Every year more people have access to internet, to social media, to YouTube, to Spotify. So there is a huge growth. Film, typically people ask about film. Of course, there are also funds out there that are acquiring film rights. But you need to specify. You're rather an expert in one thing than a mediocre idiot in ten things, is my humble opinion. So on the, just on that and what you just said there, the artist is getting a bigger share of his or her, uh, the revenue driven from his or her IP, right? And uh, in either Utopia or, or Music Bird, is there an incentive to keep the cost to produce revenue low? The cost of, because it's, uh, the, the music industry was famous for being bloated, for having costs running rampant. So if you're measuring it, and it, it becomes more data-driven, and more people have a share in the upside, presumably more people have a, uh, an incentive to keep the costs low and tight, no? Yes, also when you look historically, in the past, 80% of the cost was in uh, production and 20% was in administration. Today, it's the opposite. 80% of the cost is happening in administration, uh, legal issues and stuff. So by, by having a platform like Utopia, if it will be globally successful, you can obviously help to, again, change that, that you have less costs in administration and legal stuff, and again, make sure that more money is actually used for the creativity, because music should be about creativity, which is missing today quite a lot, because it's quite a lot copy-pasting today. Okay, excellent. Any Thank last question? question? Here we got one from Yanni. an asset the class, right? Yes. Isn't it, isn't it dependent on um, sort of the purchase power, disposable income of the people that read it? So microeconomically wise, it is actually correlated with ups and downs. So of course, I fully agree with you. Uh, there are some correlations to, to income and stuff. But then again, if you look at the Spotify subscription today, that costs you 10 to $12. That is extremely uh, cheap, right? So, uh, of course, you need to have money to go to concerts, buy fan articles and stuff, but in, it's not correlated to public markets, it's not correlated to, to equity markets, it's not correlated to real estate, it's, not correlate, it's, it's uncorrelated from any other asset class. Of course, certain, certain macro and microeconomic factors, like you're mentioning, of course, have an impact, yeah. But it is uncorrelated from any other asset class. Just last question. Yeah. It's much nicer to have interaction with the audience. I like it. Thank you, guys. Jonas, thanks for the, thanks for the presentation there. What's your view on, on uh, uh, where, uh, the technology disruption in that particular creative industry is growing rapidly, right? And now we kind of touched upon the NFTs, 
you had Kings of Leon basically giving their um, songs and rights to the songs to all their 10,000 fans, so the rap artists are doing it, which is fantastic because it needed total disruption. <laughs> but it, uh, how long do you think that is going to take for this to be the normal practice in that music industry? It's a good question. We discussed it again together, right, yesterday. I think, very honestly, that uh, the whole tokenization is a huge uh, opportunity for the music industry, like any other asset class similar to art, uh, cars, real estate. I think it takes quite some time. The biggest issue at the moment I see in legislation uh, topics, because uh, unfortunately, legal matters are very complicated, especially when it has a global reach, like uh, IP copyright. Um, we are talking to all the big NFT tokenizations platforms that are out there today that are emerging because obviously I would like to tokenize my assets and sell it back to the fan base and get liquidity to buy more assets, right? It's uh, my dream. But I think it takes five plus years to, to really get there. But that's why I built till there a one billion portfolio to be one of the first to then actually capitalize on that opportunity to, to get liquidity back fast and grow faster. Right, thanks, man. Thank you. Jonas, thank you. Thank you very much for that. It was super insightful and really thank appreciate you. you coming. Yeah, and I really appreciate you coming out from Switzerland. Thank Jonas you very Anchor. much. Excellent. Thank you so much.